Hey, how's everybody doing? Good morning. Welcome to uh, our conference, uh, Religious Persecution, Privilege, Paranoia, and Hope. We're so glad you're here. Um, I just wanted to have um, to give some opening remarks. We have Rogers Cafe, which is open on the other side of this building. They'll be open all day for um, your refreshments. Um, also, if you're an MU student in the undergrad, we have chapel credit signups available for you to get your credit in. Um, our director, uh, Paulus Metzger, Dr. Paulus Metzger, is currently in New Haven, so he can't join us today, but we have a couple of videos from him. Um, his, his new book, uh, Beatitudes, not Platitudes, Jesus' Invitation to the Good Life, is out. We have a couple of copies out um, by the registration table. Um, you should have received a small packet um, from the registration table looking like this. It'll have all of the information as far as the sessions and the plenary sessions um, and the room numbers. If you don't have one, they're also out at the table um, on the other side of this building. So the first video we have here is um, Dr. Metzger talking about uh, the Beatitudes, Not Platitudes book. Yeah, so, so why did you write a book on Beatitudes? I have no idea. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, that's not, okay, so I'll start over. You said I didn't write it, God wrote it. Yeah, God wrote it, <laughs> and therefore you have to buy it. <laughs> God wrote it. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, and I'm professor of Christian Theology and Theology of Culture at Multnomah University and Seminary in Portland, Oregon. I also direct Multnomah University's Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins. And I'm the author of The Beatitudes, Not Platitudes, Jesus' Invitation to the Good Life. We can never get enough of Jesus' words. The longest sermon of Jesus' in the Bible, in the New Testament, is the Sermon on the Mount, and it starts out with the Beatitudes. And I wish there were more and more books written on the Beatitudes in our day because so often we're not really accounting for its message. There are many reasons why I think people pass over the Beatitudes. One reason is that some think that it's simply for the nation of Israel back then in the day. Or for some, it's so high in its ideals that it can't be lived out. They're just moral maxims to account for just by way of thinking about but not to live out. And third, because of the prosperity gospel, we so often will go around the Beatitudes or transform their message to individualize and privatize them in such a manner that they were not really getting at the heart of Jesus. And while Jesus wants us to bring it home to our heart uh, individually and personally, it has far more significance than simply that. That's important, but there's also how it transforms our whole orientation toward life in community and our society as a whole. And when Jesus speaks forth the Beatitudes, it's an invitation, it's his State of the Union address for his kingdom. And he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. This is what's entailed in being involved in his kingdom. And he invites us to participate in this countercultural and upside down kingdom, which never gets old and which is always new. And Jesus invites us today to join him in his kingdom mission. You've heard the expression, those who control the terms of debate control the debate. And so often people have in mind a vision of what the good life is. And then we project that onto Jesus and his Beatitudes, the, the blessed life or the honorable life. And when I think of the honorable life and the blessed life in terms of Jesus, it looks very different from how the world looks at it. I mean, just put Jesus in the context in which he uttered these words, you know, blessed are the meek. In the context of the Pax Romana, people wouldn't have been thinking that blessed are the meek really are gonna be the ones who inherit the earth. It would have been the Roman government. It would be the Roman system. And we have the Pax Americana and all that. And it's like the meek, the meek aren't gonna inherit the earth. No, but for Jesus, the meek will inherit the earth. It's not the mighty. It's not those who run over you. Or blessed are the poor in spirit. We tend to think those who are haughty in spirit, those who are self-righteous, who are full of themselves, are truly the ones 
who are gonna make it. But Jesus says, no, you need to be spiritually bankrupt if you really wanna live the blessed or honorable life. And Jesus defines that and as we participate in him and as he calls us to himself, we are honored because of our union with Christ Jesus. And, and as we enter more and more fully into that reality and we embody more and more what we're united with him in, namely his character, his calling, his story, his very being through the spirit, it reshapes our vision, it reshapes our persons, it reshapes our engagement of the church and the society at large. And so Jesus reorients us to help us understand anew what the good or the blessed or the honorable life is. And Jesus needs to be the one for the, the Christ follower who defines the terms and not myself, not me, my lonesome I, but Jesus needs to do that more and more in my life and in and his followers' lives in the context of a society where it all too often the good life looks very different. St. Augustine gives us an account of three types of people when he thinks about the blessed life and uh, the happy life, the honorable life. And one type of person is the tortured soul. This is the type of person who actually sees the good life, sees the blessed or honorable life, uh, but cannot possess it. Uh, it's like someone behind bars and it's right there, and that's the state of their soul. They're tortured. Uh, a second type of person is the cheated soul. This is the person who actually thinks they have the good, the honorable life, the blessed life, the happy life, but they don't. It's fake or it's far, far from really truly becoming blessed, but they think they're living the blessed life and they're cheating themselves. The third type of person is the diseased soul. This is someone who doesn't seek the good life or someone who actually uh, has the good life but doesn't even realize that they have the good life. Maybe it's a person who's always seeing the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, so to speak. But the cheated soul, the diseased soul, the tortured soul, Jesus, while he's not in count, accounting necessarily for those three categories, maybe a whole assortment of categories, including those, Jesus redefines for us what the good, blessed, honorable life is, and it helps us, it heals us from having this cheated, tortured, diseased soul so that we truly have the blessed, honorable life in him. Welcome to New Wine, New Wineskins Conference, Religious Persecution, Privilege, Paranoia, and Hope. This conference theme has great relevance to us here in the United States and for Christians globally. And not only for Christians, but for people of various faith traditions as we hear reports more and more of how people are being persecuted for their convictions, their spiritual convictions, people from across the globe. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, and I'm the director of the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins, at Multnomah University and Seminary. And I'm not able to be with you in person for this conference because I'm out on the East Coast serving as the Senior Scholar in Residence at the Overseas Ministry Studies Center in New Haven, Connecticut for the spring semester. While here doing research and ministry, I have the privilege of working with residents from across the globe people who are Christians from various countries who are serving in other countries as missionaries or in their own countries, some of which face great challenges in terms of their faith. And so I'm going to be interviewing a few of them today because I think we have so much to learn from them in terms of what it means to be Christians in the midst of persecution and when we're losing our privileges, at least that's how many of us will see it, that we're being persecuted for our faith, and that we're being uh, those who are losing our privileges, what might we learn from Christians from across the globe in terms of their own experience? And I believe you're going to find in their answers some rich wisdom that comes from a deep well of trusting in God and from profound experience. So without further ado, we'll go to those residents who will be responding to questions related to our five conference motifs or aims. Brother Nathan, how might we become more discerning regarding the difference between persecution and a loss of Christian privilege 
here in the United States? So, two nations in brief, memoir, background. So, in memoir, all the missions works started by American Baptist missions, uh, such as mission school and Christians hospitals were nationalized in 1962. When the military junta came to the power, uh, since then the church have been self-governing, self-supporting, and self-propagating in their mission work. But the church has been growing and surviving in the midst of uh, difficulties and challenges. Uh, democratization started in 2010. Uh, now freedom of worship is in the constitution, but freedom of expression is still limited. Uh, the issue is even a lot of change of regions. So doing mission works in tra traditional way will be challenged in the future. Uh, in compare with the loss of <clears throat> the loss of U.S. Uh, the loss of privileges in the states. So I will not see that the United States is losing its privileges. So I just see they are losing their energies to revive their missions. And uh, Christian privilege, uh, there is two different things. Uh, when you come to persecution, you are talking maybe somebody persecuted for his faith, his belief in Christ. Uh, then he can be locked up in prison, he can be beaten or, or he, he can be bound not to say anything about God again. Then another thing again, persecution can also be caused by we ourselves. Maybe the way we interact with people, the way we talk to others, and uh, our conduct, if it's causing problem for others. So that may be one area that people will go away from us. They will not want to hear us and they will not want to identify with us. That's another type of persecution. But Christian privilege is that God has given us opportunity as Christians to believe in him and to allow him fight for us and also to vindicate us when we feel maltreated. But when we look at what is happening in the whole world today, particularly in the United States, we see that there is a lot of talking about social justice and talking about right. Uh, because of this thing, Christian in United States no longer depend more on God, but they depend. They can go to court for every little thing to claim their right. They want to defend themselves, and they want to prove that they are right. They want to seek justice, uh, human justice, that kind of a thing, which. Uh, supposed not to be like that for Christians to always seeking to know to show that they are right in every situation. How can we become victorious and resilient in the face of challenges to the faith in view of our living hope and God's sovereign providential love? I believe in the providence of God in our ministry uh, as Joseph's told to his brothers, but as for you, you meant even against me, but God meant it for good. So, uh, I like to say man's extremity is God's opportunity. Man's extremity is God's, God's opportunity. opportunity. Yes. So, in our ministry, we need to be faithful to the end. We become victorious by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our witness, our mm -hmm. testimony. Mm -hmm. As told in Revelation 12 and 11. Mm, amen. How can we learn to become more flexible and pliable to navigate various faith challenges so that we will be better witnesses to the good news of Jesus Christ? 
yeah, that question looks uh, somehow difficult. But as Christians, we are called to be light wherever we find ourselves, no matter the situation. And to be able to win the other faith to Christ, we must show love, even in tampering justice with mercy. We must also learn how to, you know, condone their ignorance. What I mean by ignorance is that they may persecute us. They may even beat us. Some of them may even kill us. But that does not mean that we should hate them. We should pray for them. And also, we shouldn't allow them to kill us. That's another distinction. Because Jesus said, something very very important as you take the gospel to somewhere and they say they don't need you he said that you should go to another place brother john how would you encourage us to grow in awareness and concern for people of various nations and religions who undergo persecution for their faith okay as christians we are taught to love our neighbors, our brothers, and our sisters. Uh, mostly those going through persecution because of their faith. We need to show concern, pray for them. That is the first thing we are called to do. We need to pray for them. You know, put ourselves in their place, that it might be us. Then that will make us to pray better and to see if there is any other assistance we can give to ease their problem. Why is it worth it to you to count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus? Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it makes me think of our Lord Jesus first. So, uh, in order to save us from our sins and and uh, make us uh, become God's children. What uh, did Jesus pay for that? Uh, the Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 6 to 8 says, Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality of, with God, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So he paid you know, such a cost uh, in order to save us from our sin and let us become God's children. Mm. Okay? So being uh, accounting the cost of being uh, the, his disciples. So last last year in august when i came to the omsc after two weeks later i heard the news from korea my mother uh, passed away so, sorry. so i you know i quickly to bought to buy a ticket and i went to korea for my mother's funeral so mm -hmm. i have been working you know in in foreign country for 12 years oh. as a missionaries so uh, I love my mother. You know, my mother really sacrificed herself for her children, and and my mother really uh, love her children. Mm. And uh, she, I uh, want to see me most mm. among among her children. But uh, I was in foreign countries. I couldn't see her often. You know, I couldn't take care of her. So, but the, it's you know costing. You know, of uh, being uh, his disciples. Mm. So it's, uh, in Korea, it's everything is uh, convenient to me. You know, like food and friends, every situation, everything kimchi. is uh, kimchi. Yeah, kimchi. <laughs> everything is, uh, is convenient, comfortable to me, right? But uh, leaving my own country to go another country, to, you know, as a missionary, is uh, I become like like a baby. Mm. 
I have to learn everything. I have to learn everything. Learn language, learn their culture, mm -hmm. you know. So it's important. So being uh, of uh, uh, his disciple is uh, denied mm -hmm. myself and empty myself like uh, our Lord Jesus, he did, right? There is worth, worth to pay you know, our cost mm. of being his disciples. Mm. Uh, the worth is God bless me now. You know, God bless me and God bless my family in present now. Mm -hmm. And also later on, God provide, God give a word and crown to me, mm. I'm sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You'll be engaging on a variety of topics at this conference, and I'm very grateful for all of you as participants and our speakers who will be sharing from their own wisdom and their own experience on the subjects and the aims of this conference. I will leave it to our able MC Tony Huynh for him to share uh, on how all these themes connect with one another as he introduces the speakers and as he ties matters together. In the meantime, in my closing moments, I would like to share briefly from Matthew chapter 5, the beatitude that reads, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I've been doing a lot of reflection on the beatitudes, and this conference comes out of this meditation that I've been doing, even a book that's just been released, Beatitudes Not Platitudes, Jesus' Invitation to the Good Life. And with this theme, of persecution, we participate in the good life defined by Jesus when we truly enter into his life of suffering. And with that, I come to verse 10 through 13. Verses 10 through 13. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are blessed when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake, not tax evasion or for being obnoxious, but when we are persecuted as identifying with Jesus in his righteousness. Now, how are we blessed? Because the kingdom of heaven belongs to us, to those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verses 11 and 12 say, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. For great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We find here that we are blessed when others persecute us, for we are aligned with Jesus and his prophets of old. That's high praise, to be aligned with Jesus and his prophets of old. Why is that a blessing? Because we are in such good company. What a privilege. And lastly, there's a warning in this passage as the beatitude closes really with this next little piece you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its saltiness, its saltiness, how is it going to be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. New Testament scholar Paul Menier says that the Old Testament sacrifices were salted before they were offered up in honor of God. And he says, when disciples do not identify with Jesus but avoid suffering, they can no longer be good salt, but their witness has lost its flavor, it's lost its uh, effectiveness. We must not avoid suffering when it truly is unavoidable and when the Lord calls us into it. We want to retain that saltiness as living sacrifices for our Lord. As we close this brief reflection, I would just say this. We're not going to agree on everything at this conference, but hopefully we would agree with what our Lord says in terms of the blessed life bound up with persecution. And may the vision of Jesus' kingdom so shape us that we are not seeking to avoid persecution and not fixated on our privileges as Christians, but that we are moving forward, not frozen in paranoia, but called forth through our hope, our living hope, in Jesus and his coming kingdom. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And God's blessings to you as you partake and participate in this conference, Religious Persecution, Privilege, Paranoia, and Hope. Welcome to New Wine, New Wineskins Conference, Religious Persecution. We, we could watch that again. Um.
as, as we uh, enter into our first plenary, there are uh, five pillars that our conference is, is built around. You can find them on um, our website, Theology of Culture, um, but let me read them to you. Um, briefly as, as we meditate and, and just interact with these pillars. First, um, today we're hoping to discern the difference between persecution and the loss of Christian privilege. Um, we're hoping to become victorious and resilient in the midst of challenges to the faith in view of our living hope in God's sovereign um, providential love. We are learning how to be flexible and pileable uh, to navigate various faith challenges so as to be more missional. We are growing in awareness and concern for people of various nations and religions who undergo persecution for their faith. And today, um, we're counting the cost of being a disciple of Jesus. And so for our first plenary session, um, we have Dr. Dan Skullberg. He's the professor and chair of the history department here at Multnomah University. He is also the dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Oregon. His areas of focus are uh, the church in the 17th century New France. Um, he investigates the encounter among the Northeastern Canadian First Nations and the French European colonial populations. Um, today, he will be sharing um, with us in regards to the formation and the fragmentation of America as a Christian nation. So would you give a hand for Dr. Dan Skullberg? Hey, is the uh, microphone on and working? Uh, can you hear me back there? Last, okay, excellent, terrific. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, um, all of this business about Beatitudes this morning, and you know, the learned Dr. Metzger has now has produced a book on the Beatitudes, and uh, I'm sure he's made a comment or at least a footnote on one of those little known Beatitudes, uh, but a more useful one, which is, uh, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Uh, so uh, that, that's interesting enough, is kind of uh, transitions into, uh, into something I noticed last Sunday as I was reading the Vancouver Columbian newspaper about some people who were submitting letters to the editor who were having a tough time being a little flexible, and they indeed were getting bent out of shape. Uh, as a result from, uh, at least according to what they were trying to publish in their letters to the editor. Please uh, follow along with me um, in my PowerPoint. Whoops. Went too far. There we go. Okay, we'll get used to it. Um, <clears throat> so what I noticed uh, in the, uh, the, the Colombian was uh, this polarization of opinion about America's religious history. And the one side, uh, which I'm labeling here the Christian right, though as I thought about it later but too late to revise, uh, would be the, the Christian Golden Age group, that America in its early history uh, was chosen by God and produced a kind of opera, early colonial period and early national period in which America was God's chosen nation, and it was kind of a Christian golden age, and the solution to problems today would be to get back to those original values. Okay. Then the other side, which wasn't really listening uh, to the, the golden age group, the dar what, I, what, what I've la labeled here non-Christian left, but probably more accurately, um, uh, the Christian dark ages group, uh, was the group that's thankful uh, that the Christians are no longer in charge. Uh, I guess they agreed with the Golden Age group that the Christians were in charge uh, in, uh, in American history, but they're glad they no longer are because it's been so much better uh, in America and so many more positive changes in American history as a result that finally uh, Christianity doesn't dominate uh, American culture. And so what I've sensed today is a kind of polarization uh, at least in part and fragmentation, the part of, uh, of the country on this role of Christianity in American history. One views it very, very positively, Christian Golden Age. The other tends to view it very, very negative, Christian Dark Ages. Boy, those Puritans, they wore black, they were baptized in vinegar, they were bigoted, 
Uh, they burned witches at the stake. Uh, they persecuted the, the First Nations peoples, and boy, are we glad that's over. Okay. So that's kind of the one side where uh, the other version is a kind of polite Sunday school version of everybody goes to church all the time and, and nobody curses uh, and, and, and uh, uh, everybody votes the right way. Uh, so, um, and, and only Christians are elected to public office. Uh, so so the, tr the trouble with these views are, there re are really two. One, they're inaccurate. Both views are inaccurate. And secondly, they fail to understand the complexities and the multiple layers of religiosity that were a part of North American culture from the very beginning. So what we'll do today in this, in our brief time together in this first session, is to at least give a little bit of the complexity as we now, as you now get to witness how a historian or a historian of religiosity deals with uh, early American culture. And it won't be any kind of exhaustive uh, presentation, but just some sense of how to deal with the complexities of the historical past is different from this problem, which is to decide what the past was like and then force my interpretation on the past. That's the problem with these approaches. So the formation of the idea of Christian nation, this idea of Christian nation does have a venerable tradition uh, in American history from uh, the early days. John Winthrop and his model of Christian charity, he was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony established 1630. He echoed uh, the Puritan assumption that appearance in society in New England would serve as an exemplary city on a hill or a model of Christian commonwealth or to quote him directly, consider this day, brethren, that we shall be as a city on a hill. So there it is, there's that Puritan vision for creating a Christian commonwealth in the landscape of Massachusetts or colonial New England. He's thinking, of course, he's saying that unlike the corrupt church, his opinion, the Church of England back home, where, he's, where they're coming from and the Puritans are leaving Church of England in the 17th century, uh, during the reigns of King James and King Charles the, the I. Unlike the corrupt church in Old England, the Puritans wanted to establish a fully reformed church in state. In so doing, Winthrop helped establish the idea of American exceptionalism, that God was directly involved in creating the American nation. This idea has been echoed by others uh, down through the a couple of centuries of American history. Cotton Mather in his Magnalia Christi Americana, published 1702, sorry, never been translated into English, but that means great work of Christ in America. Except with Mather, you get a little bit of pessimism thrown in, a little bit more reflective approach, less optimistic. So then now we're getting close to 100 years after the establishment of, of colonial, congregational, Puritan Massachusetts, and he's saying, we tried, in his Magnalia, Mather says, we tried and we failed. We tried to establish a Christian commonwealth, we failed. Nevertheless, this idea of American exceptionalism uh, continues on. Over time, Winthrop's emphasis on Massachusetts Bay as being in New Jerusalem was secularized into a more modern non-Christian notion of American exceptionalism, which continues to emphasize the uniqueness of America's destined role in history. And of course, you get that in, in every national election uh, from Cotton Mather to the you know, present time, or for, I should say from the American Revolution to present, you know, it's every presidential candidate has to, has, whether they believe it or not, has, has to trumpet this idea of American exceptionalism. So in its secularized form, to give you some examples, Alexis de Tocqueville, in the middle of the 19th century in his democracy in America, he's not talking about Christian commonwealth, but he talks about this unique role uh, that America is going to play as an enlightened nation. Not a godly nation, but an enlightened nation. George Bancroft in his history of the United States, also in the middle of the 19th century, famous for his manifest destiny thesis that America had a manifest right to expand its influence from shore to shore, the Atlantic to the Pacific. Oh, isn't it terrific? 
Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, professor of history at University of Wisconsin in his Frontier in American History, also in a social scientific version of American exceptionalism, said what makes America unique is its frontier environment. Okay. Well, all of these are sort of uh, the idea of America is a chosen nation but without the personal God idea attached to it. So here's what I'm thinking of. You may have even seen this painting. Uh, Manifest Destiny, popularized by American historian George Bancroft in the mid-19th century as America's manifest right to expand. Uh, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, Bancroft secularized Winthrop's idea of the early American colony's God-given uniqueness, yet still preserved the political idea of America's special place in the world. And then in our, or in my time, uh, I noticed uh, uh, as a graduate student at, uh, starting at the University of Oregon, uh, I noticed this revival of this idea of American exceptionalism among the um, uh, American evangelical Protestant community with the publication first of Peter Marshall's Light and Glory, Did God Have a Plan for America? And then similarly, Jerry Falwell, the moral majority fame, echoed Mar the Marshall thesis in his Listen uh, to America. Uh, both books helped revive in the popular evangelical mind, in the popular evangelical mind, the idea of America as a distinctly and uniquely a God-chosen nation. The problem with the thesis of the book is that it's overly simplistic, and it's one-dimensional, and therefore an inaccurate view of America's past. It's a popular view, but it's a view that hasn't been particularly helpful in the national dialogue between Christian and non-Christian, as our country has both uh, in it. Um, so the fragmentation of the idea, although both the popular um, uh, liberal left, or I think now better put, or I should have better stated, uh, dark, a Christian Dark Ages view and the popular a Christian Golden Age view, what they both agree on is that America's Christian identity was strongly influential in the past. The former views it as a negative force to overcome or reject, while the latter sees it as a positive influence to be maintained or returned to. Nevertheless, both perspectives carry major historical fallacies and in their simplicity do not capture the truth about America's religious history. Both positions commit the error of historical presentism. I have some history majors out there who are now nodding in agreement. Yep, we've heard that. Skalberg, he's talking about the fallacy of historical presentism or chronological snobbery uh, is another of uh, these great fallacies in the popular mind. Um, presentism, sometimes known as wiggery, in which uh, predetermined modern perceptions of the past are used to manipulate popular political perception. Both positions are interested in sound bites for political propaganda or for slogans for their campaign. Neither position is interested in seriously researching the historical context of colonial America to understand the complex nature of historical reality. In short, both sides ignore established historical fact and as a last resort, lob verbal, in their ignorance, lob verbal grenades at each other. That's what people do when they are ill-informed. The complexity and diversity of American religious history then is what I want to focus on uh, for the, the rest of my time. Uh, there was a very wise man who taught history at Wheaton College, uh, retired at the end of the 1970s. His name is Earl Cairns. He wrote a very good book, should read it, change your life if you do. It's kind of like the Bible, read it, change your life. Read this book, change your life. If you don't want your life changed, don't read it. Um, he said, historical causation is never single and simple. It is always multiple and complex. And that's the problem with these two stereotypes about the past, dark Christian dark age, Christian golden age. They're simplistic, overly simplistic interpretations that ignore the historical realities. And therefore they are not helpful at getting at the truth about American culture and the situation that we find ourselves in today. Therefore, an accurate treatment of America's religious past must include factors like the following. First Nations religiosity. European colonists did not settle in an unoccupied wilderness. 
boy, you read Winthrop and you think that's what what he thinks. It's, he talks that way. His mention of First Nations peoples is uh, a side reference to their being uncivilized, without faith, without law, without king, and because they have no sovereign rights, they're like the Canaanites in the promised land, and we're coming to the promised land, and we're going to do to them what the ancient Israelites did to the Canaanites. Two, denominational diversity. European colonists brought a variety of Christian denominations to the colonies. They did not agree on many theological matters. There was little sense of Christian unity in the early colonial period. There's plenty of Christianity in the early colonial period. That is, the colonists who are coming from, the European colonists who are coming are Christians, but they're from many different denominations in an age in which religious tolerance does not prevail, and they mostly don't like each other. So the Puritan Congregationalists of Massachusetts, yeah, they're there, and they are Christians, but they don't like the Baptists in Rhode Island, and they don't like the Quakers in Pennsylvania, and they don't like the, Quaker, uh, the Catholics in Maryland, and they're, of course, because they're the Antichrist. There's no religious toleration. There's no Christian golden age in which uh, it's not even the Christians agree on what America is supposed to be. Three, the forced African diaspora to America resulted in complex and often syncretistic religious expressions from multiple religious sources. More on all of these as we go through now uh, to, cut, uh, to give uh, again, to, again just to give us a little taste of how complex America's religiosity is from the very beginning of the first wave of European colonial settlement. America before Columbus. There was such a thing, and it was filled full of people who'd been in North America for millennia. Uh, and these multiple Atlantic language groups, uh, this is a particular interest to me. Uh, in my doctoral dissertation, I, uh, my doctoral advisor said, Skullberg, boy, have you, have you bit off a, a doctoral uh, research topic that's probably more than you can chew, but if you still decide to do a transatlantic dissertation that brings Europe and America together, then you're going to have to study anthropology. That's the first thing you're going to need. And it's here, I'm a historian, you know, doctoral candidate in history, now being told I have to go back to school and study anthropology. Well, the reason why I needed to do that was because he said, you need to become a First Nations scholar if you're going to write this dissertation. And so I became immersed, went to the Newberry Library in Chicago, which is the Darcy McNichol Center for the Study of the First Nations. And fortunately got a fellowship to pay for it and studied First Nations history for two summers in a row, the entire summer that paid for these, to immerse myself in the scholarship of American First Nations, particularly as it related to Northeastern Woodlands Indians, Algonquin and Iroquois speaking populations, um, to get a sense of multiple Atlantic language groups and tribal identities that inhabited America long before millennia before any European settlement. These peoples were very sophisticated. They had sophisticated trading relationships. Uh, we wish we had time today to go over it because we're so ignorant in this country about First Nations history. But there's this wonderful trading networks that took place between coastal uh, Algonquin-speaking populations and inland Iroquois-speaking populations. They had a sophisticated trade that was trading tobacco in the south to, for beaver skin in the north and uh, from beaver skin in the west to uh, seashells on the, on the, among the coastal Indians and dried codfish and so on. So it's a very sophisticated trade. When the Europeans show up, the Europeans just enter into that trade. That's very sophisticated. From the First Nations point of view, well, if the Europeans want to come, that's fine. They can enter into the trade. So, so today, remember, when we talk about First Nations people, we don't want to confuse languages, First Nations languages, with tribal identities. Algonquin speakers is their language. The Montanay, the Mi'kmaq, and the Abenaki are tribes that are part of the First Nations encounter between European so when Winthrop and company, when Puritans arrive, or whatever colony we're talking about, Jamestown in Virginia, uh, 
uh, Lord Baltimore's colony in Maryland, or these First Nations people that they're accounting, uh, countering, if they tend to be close to the coast, they tend to be Algonquin speakers. And I'm just giving you some tribal names. First Nations peoples want to be known by their tribal names, and they want us to, or they want us to be not ignorant that there is a difference between the languages they speak or the languages they have in common in their tribal national identity. Iroquois, among Iroquois speakers are the Seneca, the Huron, the Mohawk, the Oneida, uh, et cetera. Political, social, religious organization fully integrated. Uh, real quick on this one, uh, just to say that not only were uh, First Nation cultures sophisticated, uh, they had uh, sophisticated not only trading relationships but political identities and organized themselves according to clan and band. Uh, and therefore, it be, that's the first level of misunderstanding between European and First Nation. Europeans come from the point of view of the European monarchy and the European nobility. Uh, and so they come looking for that among First Nations and they don't find it. First Nations didn't organize themselves politically the way Europeans did. And so that's the first level of misunderstanding. So from the European point of view, the First Nations are without king, because they don't have kings. Sometimes there's miscommunication going on, so they'll talk to the Seneca, and they'll ask the Seneca for their king, and then the Seneca produce the clan mother because the clan mother is in charge. The clan mother has veto power over whether the one tribe can go to war against another. It's how much power and influence. And their, their First Nations, uh, among the Seneca, the First Nations passed um, wealth, uh, tri the tribal wealth matrilineally, not patrilineally. Uh, so all this tremendous misunderstanding in these early days that leads to confusion, that leads to prejudice, leads to stereotyping. All First Nations political tasks and social function carry deep spiritual meaning. Therefore, First Nations peoples maintain durable religious customs, resistant to European missional encroachments. I don't have to recount that. There's very little success in Christianity in leading First Nations peoples to Christ because of these stereotypes, because of these misunderstandings, because of these prejudices that are bred in to this early period in American history. First Nations religious traditions, wish we had more times, fascinating material. First Nation religious traditions like wampum, which of course, uh, which you have on display here in our, we have this uh, uh, young Huron uh, man who is proudly displaying the tribal inheritance uh, through the beautiful, beautifully woven with, uh, with the use of the purple and white shells. Uh, the coastal shells that these northeastern woodlands Indians used in what, would be new, what today would be New England the New England states and Eastern Canada, uh, Quebec, Canada. Uh, the wampum, of course, records the religious history of the tribe and it, it indicates the political uh, identity of the tribe. And when tribes make alliances, whether they're political or economic or both, they exchange belts. They exchange the wampum belts. And, and if they seek to renegotiate, then they bring the belts back. Uh, and if they're renegotiation, they redecorate the belts and they, they renew the trading negotiation. Or if they end the trade agreement, then they, they each gets their belt back. Uh, the great calumet of peace. This cements the tribal alliances and symbolizes spiritual tribal identity in, in ceremonial smoking. This is one of the things that, in a sense, cultural assimilation is a two-way street. There are all kinds of things that, with it, First Nations uh, contributed to, to European colonial settlement patterns and customs. And of course, we know that pipe smoking is one of those, you know, as the, uh, as, the, uh, as the sons and daughters of Virginia found out that tobacco makes life sweet. Uh, and also in the colony of Carolina, tobacco makes life sweet and it can become the foundation of the colonial economy. Uh, so, uh, but for, uh, for First Nations, tobacco smoking was a ceremonial activity. It wasn't a recreational activity. That's what it becomes among the European uh, populations. But the great calumet of peace, here are some examples here, uh, indicate the sense of durable reli uh, uh, indigenous religiosity. These are artifacts, not just museum pieces. They are living symbols of an enduring religious tradition that is in America to this very moment. And uh, in the First Nations tradition, you mean no harm if you're carrying the great calumet. 
So if you go forward, you just imagine this in the woods. If you're, you're, on a, you're in a part of, a, of a, a hunting band and you're going forward on a hunt, the way you ensure to your neighbors is that that's all, you're ar- that's all you are. You know, obviously, you're armed to the teeth uh, for the hunt, but you mean no harm to another tribe. You're just uh, hunting deer or beaver or whatever it is, and you hold the, the point person holds the great calumet of peace. And, of course, the Europeans realize this, and even folks like Lewis and Clark, will, their point person will carry the great calumet of peace, no harm intended, just passing through, uh, blessings be upon you. And if need be, if you want to cement it, uh, want to cement real peace, is that you sit down and have the ceremonial smoking to ensure good hunt, good weather, all the good stuff we want. Mixed European reaction in culture, cultural encounter. So here it is. So now, very briefly on these images, uh, the Europeans develop stereotypical images about First Nations peoples, that is, these early Christians, stereotype the First Nations. One of the common stereotypes is, that I already alluded to is Canaanite savagery. At first, Europeans sought to, out of necessary, to cooperate and coexist with First Nations people. Nevertheless, some early American Puritan leaders, Cotton Mather and American colonial governors, John Winthrop, embraced the idea that First Nations peoples were illegitimate inhabitants of a new promised land. As such, they came to be viewed as primitive peoples without rights under the laws of England, having neither faith nor law or king. If you want to read about it, you don't have to take my word for it. Read Winthrop's journal uh, and his... uh, his uh, uh, model of Christian charity to get those ideas well established. But there is another uh, equally uh, damaging stereotype uh, that uh, became common among uh, Europeans in this early period of encounter, this idea of natural nobility, that the First Nations were naturally noble people, not naturally savage, but naturally noble. Many European clergy and missionaries employed pious descriptions of First Nations peoples as a foil to criticize the so-called lax uh, European Christianity back home. European Christianity back home. According to the Jesuit relations, these are the relations that, by the way, Jesuit missionaries who were sent to the Americas were required by their order to send an annual report back home to their superior uh, in Europe who would read these. And of course, we have to realize these are missionary accounts. So you're having to both promote the mission, meaning make it sound really great, and you're also having to talk about the troubles you're facing, because if you don't, because if it's all good, you won't get support. Uh, and then you're also having to talk about how receptive the First Nations peoples are, uh, uh, and you can use that as a way of blasting the lackadaisical, lukewarm supporters of mission back in the, you know, the lay folks back in the pews back in Europe. So that's what you get from these relations. By the way, they're well published. If you want to read them all, these have been translated into English, whether they're, they're mostly original language or Spanish and French reports from Jesuit missionaries, but they've all been translated by English by that great University of Wisconsin historian, Reuben Gold Sweatthwaites. So you don't have to torture yourself by reading the French edition, which I've posted a title page up there for you. Um, According to Jesuit relations and some Protestant thinkers, Roger Williams and Mère Marie de l'Incarnation, uh, uh, by the way, Mère Marie de l'Incarnation is not Protestant. That's a, a mistake I made in my text here. She's a Roman Catholic uh, uh, Mother Superior of the Ursuline Order in Quebec, but she's very dedicated to missional work among First Nations, uh, Huron peoples. Anyway, but either case, the indigenous peoples need to be treated with respect as God's image bearers as sovereign peoples governed by international law. So that's the, that's the other kind of view of First Nations peoples, that they're naturally uh, without sin. They ha- these are the peoples that didn't experience the fall. Or sometimes they're the lost tribes of Israel. It's another kind of, that goes along with the, sort of this naturally noble. They're ennobled peoples. They're innocent peoples. They haven't been corrupted by European civilization and its corrupt European churches. They're naturally noble. And boy, they're going to be easy to make Christians. And once they come to Christ, they'll make perfect Christians, unlike the corrupt, civilized folks back home. Yeah. Whoops. 
Uh, well, this, even these ideas became to be secularized uh, in American history as we move into the 18th century and we move into the early national period in American history. By the middle of the 18th century, the rationalistic and secular image of the noble savage became popular. Some Enlightenment thinkers, like there he is, one of my favorites, Voltaire, um, uh, some Enlightenment thinkers argued that in a state of nature, humans are essentially virtuous. According to uh, the moral sense uh, in humans, uh, accordingly, the moral sense in humans is natural and innate and based on intuition rather than resulting from the influence of civilization. Over time, the American white majority population developed damaging stereotypes of First Nations peoples from this assumption. This is what First Nations people refer to as white man's Indian. White man's Indian. So we have all of these images, and I, I even thought about putting up the mascot image of the Cleveland Indians up there, because that's another one of these damaging stereotypes uh, of, of First Nations peoples. They're unfortunate, uh, they're cruel, uh, and they're hurtful, these kinds of images. First Nations peoples are human beings, and they're like you, and they're like me, and they hurt when stare at when they are treated unkindly through stereotyping. Crossing European Christianity in America. Christianity was transplanted from Europe and pluralistic in nature. So yeah, uh, it's not, uh, Europeans didn't come to an un uninhabited desert island. Uh, they came to a continent that had hundreds of thousands of people that had lived in North America for millennia. Christianity was transplanted from Europe and pluralistic in nature. It was multi-denominational from day one virtually. That's within the first 30 years. Six different uh, uh, denominations planted in the first 30 years of, of permanent colonial European occupation as a result of the Protestant Reformation impact. Lots of different European denominations because the Reformation's right on the eve of European, North American European colonial settlement. Denominations in early America. Within the first three decades of European settlement, these denominations were planted. 1607, Anakins, Jamestown, Williamsburg. 1608, Roman Catholic Church, Quebec. 1620, European Separatist Congregational Church, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Those are the Plymouth Pilgrims, Plymouth Rock folks. 1628, Dutch Reformed, New York, which was called New Amsterdam. Remember, New York was not an English colony originally. It was a Dutch colony. It was named New Amsterdam. Then eventually the English at the end of the 17th century purchased it from the Dutch, seeking to make uh, coinage, uh, and uh, it then was New York, named after the Duke of York, uh, the heir to the English throne, uh, James II, uh, at the time. Um, 1630, Puritan Congregational Church, uh, Salem, Boston, Massachusetts, that's the John Winthrop colonial group. 1634, Roman Catholic Church, Maryland, that's the Lord Baltimore group. Uh, 1636, the Baptist, Roger Williams, Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island group. They got kicked out of Boston uh, with a big fight, church fight uh, there in Boston between the, the Congregationalists and then the Congregationalist Baptists who, uh, who uh, objected to certain Interestingly enough, a number of things, but one of those, the abuse of First Nations peoples by the Massachusetts colonial settlement. That was one of Roger Williams' great gripes. He felt that, he said, these are sovereign peoples, he's speaking of the First Nations, these are sovereign peoples made in the image of God. We need to respect their sovereign rights. If we want to purchase land from them, fine, purchase land through proper legal negotiation. Don't rob them of their land. Denominations in early America. Early American Christianity did not embrace a culture of tolerance. Each Christian denomination went to America to worship distinctly in their own way without having to tolerate the existence of other denominational varieties, thus contributing to the lack of political unity in American colonial settlement pattern. Of course, this will haunt uh, the, early Amer uh, the new United States in the early national period, and you know enough about American history that you know, George Washington practically gives up on the whole experiment, you know, and they, he's, thinking, he's sorely tempted to become the monarch uh, of America because it's so hard to get the colonies, now states, uh, to agree on anything. It just takes, it takes a better part of a decade to finally get a, a formal constitutional document together because of this fight over states' rights and federalism and so on. 
uh, shaping of colonial intellectual values. Now, see, what I don't want this to be is a uh, let's beat up on the New England Puritans uh, session, because that's not what I actually rather like the New England Puritans. <laughs> No, I don't mean everything they do, uh, but, but they, they, they do a lot that's to be admired, and they do really play an important role in the shaping American culture in this early time period. Um, one of the enduring contributions of American Christianity from the early period, particularly from the Puritan and Anakin perspective, was the establishment of its Ivy League colleges. Harvard University, 1634. See how early it is? That, by the way, that's inaccurate. It should be 1636. Um, uh, so within six years of the um, uh, establishment of a colony in Boston, they've created a university. That's how deeply interested Anglican Puritans were in higher education. College of William and Mary, that's an Anglican college. It's a result of uh, colonial Jamestown Williamsburg experience, 1693. There's the original building in that photograph. That's the 1693 building, College of William and Mary. Yale University established 1701, where the learned Dr. Metzger is, in New Haven, Connecticut right now, and Princeton University, 1746. The idea of these college was to train those people who sought ministry in the colony. Ministry isn't just clergy ministry, it's political. This comes from the British, you know, the British talk about ministers as politicians. They're called their, their prime minister is a minister, but he's, but he's the political leader of the country. You know, and the queen's the sovereign, but you know, uh, uh, but Theresa May is the prime minister. Um, so the training for a ministry, a ministry is a political leadership as well as an ecclesiastical leadership in the liberal arts tradition. Sometimes I hear a gripe out there from some well-meaning Christians that say, oh, those early colleges, they, those, were, those were Bible colleges and, and uh, that have kind of fallen away from teaching Bible and theology. You know, that is what they mean is that Harvard, what it was, the place was to go there to study Bible and theology. No, Harvard was established to study for students to study the liberal arts. All of these colleges were established for students to study the liberal arts because the liberal arts, as Christian, one, I call it the liberal arts Christianity's second greatest gift to Western civilization. The first gift is the gospel. The second gift is the liberal arts tradition because the liberal arts tradition formed in the bosom of Christianity was, is what people who are going to be leaders need to study and know general knowledge before they study specialized knowledge. So you need to study the liberal arts first, then you study theology. Study the liberal arts first, then you study medicine. Study the liberal arts first, then you study law. Not the other way around. You don't start with theology or medicine or law. You need the foundation subjects. And that's why these colleges were established for the foundation. Uh, training ministers of the liberal arts tradition, for church and political function was a priority among early Christian denominations. See Perry Miller's wonderful book, The New England Mind in the 17th Century, on this particular issue. It's quoting Perry Miller, that professor of history at Yale University, of course, uh, now passed away, but uh, in his great book, The American Puritans, which I'm featuring there by picture, again, read it, change, it'll change your life. He says, Puritanism was not an anti-intellectual fundamentalism, it was a learned scholarly movement that required on the part of its followers not only knowledge, but a respect for the Greco-Roman cultural heritage. Perry Miller, Yale University, American Puritans, page 265. By the way, Miller was no friend of, Purit of Puritanism. He was not a Puritan, not a Congregationalist, not a Christian. Yet he admired the role that Christianity played in these early days of laying a foundation a common foundation for the training of its generations in higher education for leadership. He greatly admired the 17th century American colonial commitment to higher education. Revivals are another characteristic of the layer of early American religiosity. The first great awakening started in Europe and was transplanted to America. 
The English-born Anglican priest George Whitfield, as America's first celebrity evangelist, brought a message that he preached up and down the Atlantic seaboard, unwittingly helping to create a unified American identity. Uh, this is a factor in leading the, uh, to the American Revolution. Ironically, a political event that Whitfield would have opposed. He was a Tory royalist. Uh, and an ardent supporter of uh, the Georgians, uh, which he's from. He's British. Uh, he's not an American colonial. Nevertheless, he's a, uh, an Anglican priest and evangelist. Uh, thankfully, he died in 1770, never seeing the unintended political results of his gospel ministry. Colonial Americans not unified in support of the American Revolution. Colonial American Christians were not unified not unified in support of the American Revolution. There you go, here's a brief schematic. It's not, uh, again, getting the general, the high points, not all the nuances. The Puritan Congregationalists tended to favor the American Revolution because they wanted to make sure uh, the monarchy could, would not force religious conformity upon them. That was their whole point for going to Massachusetts in the first place. And they felt like a political separation would achieve that, and it certainly did. But the Puritans were ultimately unhappy with the result of the American Revolution because the American Revolution politically secularized America by creating a system of church and state and an agnostic state. Okay. Uh, a state that allows freedom of expression but doesn't promote, I've been talking about religious expression, but doesn't promote any one version of religiosity. The Puritans were not happy with the ultimate formula. And neither were the Anakins of Virginia. And they condemned Thomas Jefferson, I'm talking about their ministers, condemned Thomas Jefferson in, in sermons, condemning him to hell uh, in, in their, their sermons of the day. Uh, they were, Anglicans tended to be Tory loyalists, so that's where they, they over here on our, our chart, they oppose the American coming of the American Revolution. Uh, because of their opposition, they remain loyal, and most of them leave the colony the Tory loyalist Anglicans, and guess where they go? Not back to England, but to Canada. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. Okay, so they go to what today is, what those days was called Upper Canada, uh, what today we call the province of Ontario, and yes, they do found that city that's filled today with British Empire loyalists is called Toronto, Canada. Uh, and they are very proud of their British Empire loyalism. Matter of fact, if, you could, if you're Canadian, you can trace your ancestry to those original Virginians who left after those crazy Americans did what they did uh, in their revolution, then you can be a daughter of a British Empire loyalist. You can be that kind of Canadian. Of course, we have our version here in the United States called a daughter of, Amer of the American Revolution. Yeah. Quakers and Catholics tended to be neutral. Uh, because they didn't know what in the world was going to be the result of this. You know, it's like take it or leave it. It may be good for us, it may be bad. Uh, and even Jonathan Edwards, who saw it coming, you know, that great uh, Congregationalist uh, uh, preacher and theologian, he's, he's, we call him Jonathan Edwards, the greatest of the early American theologians, he was ambivalent about revolutionary activities because he felt it could be good, it probably won't be. Uh, uh, and it mostly won't be helpful uh, for, uh, from his perspective at least, in the future of the country. Many Congregationalist, Presbyterian, Evangelical New Lights like Edwards became increasingly ambivalent about the revolutionary Repu Republican thought, fearing its radicalization. See Mark Knoll, Christians in the American Revolution. Wonderful book, read it, change your life. African American religious experience as we wrap it up. Again, these are not, I'm not giving you all the layers of American religiosity from day one. By day one, I mean the European encounter with the, the continent. But at least I'm giving you at least three decent, some treatment of at least three layers that are there from the beginning. America's religiosity is diverse from the minute the colonists get on the Atlantic shore. Due to forced migration as a result of the transatlantic slave trade, the diverse African religious context was made up of three religious forms. Most of the Africans in the forced diaspora of 
of millions of Africans from the uh, sub-Saharan western part of the African continent were Muslim peoples. That's the majority. The second largest group arriving in the Americas uh, of Africans involved in the slave trade, forced slave trade, race-based slave trade, uh, were de devout followers of African traditional and then eventually plantation syncretism in a plantation environment. And then some of them were Christians. This is the smallest number. Uh, well, these were West African Christians known as Ladino because they often spoke Spanish or Portuguese among their own indigenous language. Due to efforts of Roman Catholic missionaries to West Africa uh, who established missions in the late 15th century. These are Jesu Portuguese Jesuit uh, missionaries and, and Franciscan missionaries. Uh, this is a very small group and once there's a realization that there are Christian peoples being transplanted in the transatlantic trade, trade they try, the European states try to cut it off because most Euro Western European nations had laws against enslaving Christians. Uh, and so they find out, you know, you've purchased your slave and in a plantation in, in Carolina and you find out the person's a Christian. At, at that time, it's against, that is prior to the American Revolution, it's against colonial law to enslave a Christian. So you're, you're now in trouble with the British authorities. Transplanted during the slave trade. Until the 1830s, here we go. Until the 1830s, more Africans than Europeans crossed the Atlantic. There it is. Boy, talk about a takeaway for today. Until the 1830s, more Africans, now again, it's forced, but more Africans than Europeans settled in North America. The first shipment of African slaves reached Hispaniola in 1502. The bulk of the early slave trade centered on the Portuguese, Spanish, and French colonies, and as such did not involve British America. But there we have it, 1641 in Massachusetts began the first English colony to legally recognize slavery. By the numbers, 16th century, uh, just short of a million. 17th century, 2.75 million. 18th century, 6.5 million. 13th century, 3.5 million for a total of 13 million. These figures indicate the number of Africans arriving in all of the Americas, North, Central, and South. We must remember to account for the genocidal 50% transatlantic mortality rate, and if so, double the total figure. See John Hope Franklin's great history. Uh, uh, from slavery to freedom, which the early chapters treat the, uh, the forced diaspora and genocide at great length. Make that 26 million Africans in the diaspora of those centuries. It's a genocide. Conversion to Christianity. During the first 120 years of black slavery in British North America, little progress was made in attracting the slave population to Christianity. Here, here are some of the reasons for the slow start. It's pretty obvious. Here it is, the ABCs. Uh, the durability of indigenous African religiosity. You're Muslim. You're indigenous African. Why become a Christian? You like your religion. Okay? Two, challenges faced uh, with African-born uh, slaves, meaning... Uh, what you have are uh, slaves born now in America, uh, but they're facing illiteracy and culture shock, uh, uh, or those transplanted from Africa also face illiteracy and culture shock because they're not being given literacy, because that would not be a good thing to me. Because the, from the slave culture point of view uh, in the Americas, you want to keep slaves illiterate. You want to keep them in a kind of culture shock, because that's better for the kind of forced labor environment on the plantations that you desire. Ethnically isolated plantation life and many slave owners oppose Christianization for obvious reasons, because if they become Christians, by British law, they have to be freed. Okay. Christianity perceived as the master's religion, that's the African view, obvious why it wouldn't be adopted, and the British colonial law discouraged evangelization among the slaves, and these same slave laws prohibited the enslaving of Christians. Finally, early successes in conversion, Whitfield's revivals attracted a noticeable percentage of African Americans. While Whitfield was no abolitionist, he did insist that uh, uh, slaves be allowed to come and hear his 
preaching, his evangelistic preaching. The Anglican Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, or what today is called the SPG, it's the major arm of the Anglican Missional uh, Global Missions Organization, specifically targeted Christian instruction for slaves. Uh, the American Revolution and abolitionist movement began to call into question the legitimacy of slavery, and Anglican and Methodist Episcopalians achieved the greatest results because they were on the vanguard of abolitionism. Nevertheless, forced segregation isolated black congregations from their white counterparts, and thus the famous episode of Richard Allen, where he then finally, uh, as a result of segregation, in his uh, he's an active member and an elder, uh, a lay elder, uh, and lay preacher in the Methodist church, but finally leaves uh, the denomination that he loves, the Methodist denomination, that he was led to Christ in, but helps to form the AME church, the, again, these famous historic uh, African-American denominations. The AME is African Methodist Episcopal Church, and then the CME, the, the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, is as uh, results of this uh, forced segregation. Conclusion. North American cultures have always included a diverse grouping of religious expression. North American Christianity has included denominational and ethnic diversity from the first decades of the European colonial transplant. The idea of America as a unified Christian nation is dubious as, at best, and there is no lost golden age to which American Christians may return. While Christianity has played a major role in the founding of the United States, other non-Christian religious and even secular ideas have also been influential. Here it is. Uh, all of my ideas come from people who know way more about these topics than I do. Uh, and so I have to give credit where credit is due. So if you want to learn, here's the starting point. If you want to learn about Northeastern Woodlands Indians and, their, and that first wave of interaction and cultural assimilation with European population, read James Axtell's The Invasion Within, a beautifully written book. Uh, he's a professor of American history and Native American religiosity at the College of William and Mary. Uh, the Search for Christian America by Noel Hatch and Marsden uh, takes up, uh, it's a book that tries to cover a broad range of topics, you know, how Christian were the founding fathers, how Christian was the American Revolution, how biblically based were the early Puritans, those kinds of questions, how Christian is an early America's history, and was America a Christian nation? That's, they, they deal with those issues. Uh, Noel is at the University of Notre Dame. Nathan Hatch used to be at Notre Dame. He's retired. Oh, that's George Marsden. Sorry, he's retired now. Uh, Nathan Hatch is the president of Wake Forest University. Uh, the Puritan Dilemma, Edwin Morgan's book, beautiful book, uh, highly recommended. If you want to know what these Puritans, if you want to engage with the Puritan mind, the 17th century Puritan mind, what were they trying to do in establishing a colony in Massachusetts? Edwin Morgan's a wonderful book. He's a professor of history at Yale, uh, but now passed away. And then uh, African-American religiosity. Here you go, here you go. This is it, my number one recommendation. Uh, Albert Robito's Canaan Land, A Religious History of, of African-Americans. Read it, change your life. You need to read it. If you haven't read it, you need to read this book. Uh, and then you will understand so much more about this great people. For a critique of the light and the glory, there it is back to that, that Christian America thesis sort of warmed over for popular evangelical consumption. A really good book, I think that does the best job of it is John Fia, he's professor of history at Covenant College. Uh, his book was America Founded as a Christian Nation. Uh, there you go, I think it's the better, best book, even better than Noel Hatch and Marsden. Um, and then if you want to learn how to think like a historian, uh, then the best <laughs> place to start uh, is uh, John Fia's uh, Why Study History, uh, reflecting on the importance of the past, with that historical causation being multi-causal, uh, not single uh, and simple. Uh, what I can do, I have to run, but what I can do, if any of you want, I could leave the two last pages of bibliography. If fo can photocopies be made? Okay. Uh, if any of you would like these, then uh, then here here you go. Uh, and uh, I don't know who I should leave them with. Oh, 
I'll give you the burden. Of. So uh, thank you. Uh, I went two minutes over time. So I guess there is not time for questions, right? We want to get back on time. Yeah, I did it deliberately two minutes over time. So because I can't answer your questions anyway. So thank you, Dr. Skullberg. Thank you. Thank you. As we're looking at the clock, um, as we transition into the, the workshops, let's, uh, let's take a moment to just settle and breathe. Um, I think we're just introduced to a lot of information. I think um, we can be in a state of, of shock at just drinking all of that in and processing. Um, some of my thoughts as I was listening to Dr. Skullberg share was, um, I think you and I live in a society and a culture that, that often um, simplifies our nation's history. And therefore, <clears throat> you and I as, as, um, as holistic people and as faithful believers are, are tasked with the duty to um, demythologize and deconstruct in light of, of the evidence that's presented to us. Um, so let us not fall into um, binary, simplistic frameworks, but let us, um, let, let's not fall into these categories of non-Christian left and religious right, but let us pursue a more holistic um, historiography of our nation. And this land that you and I live in has a history. I mean, uh, its history did not begin with uh, Europe, but we are a part of this land's history. So how do we move forward from there? Um, so as we move into our, our uh, workshops, let me read to you um, the first section. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Mike Gurney and Dr. Brad Harper sharing on um, You Can't Have My Cake and Eat It Too, Religious Freedom, Christian Bakers, and Gay Marriage in Travis Lovett. That is our seminary building. Um, there are signs posted all across campus. And then we have Harris Safar um, sharing on the plank in our eye, looking at Muslim persecution in America, also in the seminary building. And then we have Dr. David Wilson um, sharing on Where's the Heart, the Home of Privilege in Bradley, the building across from us. So we'll go from that from 1030 to 1120. And then from there, hopefully you can look in your packets as to um, the second set of, of workshops. And then from there at 1220, would you join us back in here for lunch and then our plenary sessions. So um, yeah.